I've said many things about Marvel's Phase 4 that could be considered negative, and it's because I genuinely believe those things and think they're interesting. But as a little change of pace, I want to say some nice things about Phase 4. And no, it's not because Kevin Feige is standing right off screen holding a shotgun. That's a coincidence. Really, this all started with a tweet that I saw, where someone said that WandaVision, Hawkeye, Moon Knight, and She-Hulk were the four worst Phase 4 projects, and I not only disagree, but I think two of them are maybe the best Phase 4 projects. And I remember there were some things I really loved about Phase 4 that, for whatever reason, we just don't talk about that much. We really do focus on the negative, and I understand why, but there's a lot of good stuff there. So I wanted to make a video where we just go through all of it. It will be 40-ish minutes of me just shilling for Marvel Phase 4, and we'll do it in release order, so we're starting with WandaVision. In my opinion, WandaVision was the best thing in Phase 4. Yeah, the ending might have been a little dumb, but that feels very motivated by COVID, so I can't fault them too much. But everything else was fantastic. Olsen and Bettany were both excellent at not only selling the emotion of these characters, but also tweaking each performance to perfectly match the style of that episode. While Bettany does not change too much about his characterization, Olsen goes from Lucy Ricardo to Samantha Stevens to Carol Brady to Mary Tyler Moore to Lois Wilkerson to Claire Dunphy and back to Wanda. It is so much fun to watch. And obviously, the new cast members were fantastic additions to the MCU, specifically Tayona Paris's Monica and Katherine Hahn's Agatha. That song was super catchy, but for me, the standout of WandaVision was the production design. That show looked perfect. Those sitcom pastiches were produced with so much care. They actually did episode one in front of a live studio audience, and the effects look great. The Vision vs. Vision fight is very fun. They get really creative with how he uses his powers against himself. Thank goodness Marvel did not skimp on the effects for the Disney Plus shows. And it is really funny. Like, even if you don't watch Marvel for the Marvel stuff, the individual episodes of WandaVision work as sitcoms. Obviously, we get less time with the sitcom world as the episodes progress, but man, as someone who grew up on classic sitcoms like The Brady Bunch and even I Love Lucy on Nick at Night, WandaVision manages to capture the charm of that old sitcom humor. And episode two may be my single favorite part of Phase 4. But WandaVision was an easy one. Let's up the difficulty a little bit. While Falcon and the Winter Soldier might not finish strong, there is a ton of good stuff in the episodes leading up to that finale. Like, this show looks great. The action scenes that focus on Falcon would feel right at home in the middle of the movies. They also managed to do some really creative things with how Sam fights. He uses the jetpack as a flamethrower, he's constantly using the wings to do a big jump, smacking people around with the wings, and Sam feels fast zipping through the helicopter, under the tractor trailer, over the helicopter. I think the effects begin to suffer somewhat as the phase progresses, but these two early shows both looked flawless. Also, the costumes in Phase 4 were as good as they've ever been. Forget about Sam's Captain America costume, his Falcon costume was a lovely homage to Sam's comic outfit. Same goes for Zemo, the mask looked terrific. And Walker. Walker's Captain America suit had so many wonderful details. The new A star emblem, the way the horizontal stripes contrasted with Sam and Steve's vertical stripes. They could have just put Walker in one of the old Captain America suits, but their designers really went hard and came up with something that is a perfect adaptation of John's comic costume. And the character work into Fatwas was top notch. Everything Isaiah did ruled. Walker had five-sixths of a solid arc. His intro is perfect. And Wyatt Russell really captured Walker's insecurity, like that 2020 vision line. I guess you'll have to look real hard. Good thing I got 2020 vision then, huh? Even small things in that show. I love that Sam, like Anthony Mackie, is from Louisiana now, and we get a look at his life and his family. When MCU characters work a lot of the time, it's because they feel like real people. Bucky goes on dates, Zemo dances, Sam is a fun uncle, and of course, this image of Walker with the bloody shield is one of the most powerful and memorable in all of Phase 4. In fact, for the shows, the end of Episode 4 was almost always a huge moment with this and Loki probably being my two favorites. Next, Black Widow. Easy one here. The casting is proof that Sarah Finn just does not miss. 
Florence Pugh has a terrific energy and seems to be having a ton of fun with this role as will be confirmed in Hawkeye. And David Harbour's Red Guardian was also thoroughly entertaining and while I do not think he's really needed on the Thunderbolts, I will be happy to see more of him. Also, it's easy to forget because some of the CGI in this movie frequently gets criticized on Twitter and I get it, but a lot of the action scenes in this movie work. The first Taskmaster fight is a perfect intro to that character. The Natasha vs. Yelena fight is appropriately grounded and has some moments that look like they really hurt. And David Harbour's physical comedy makes the prison escape scene very entertaining. And the very end of the Widow Taskmaster fight when they're on the ground is very raw. Also, this was, I believe, the first MCU movie where the lead actor also got a producer credit and that's very cool. Especially for Scarlet, who's been in these movies longer than anyone currently in the MCU besides Gwyneth, Sam Jackson, and Favreau. And maybe Tim Roth, but he's only in three things. I do not want to spend a ton of time on Loki because it was really good and everyone liked it, but a couple things. Richard E. Grant may be my single favorite bit of phase forecasting. Ever since the Spice World days, Grant has never been afraid to go for it, and he really does here. And that costume, and all of the Loki costumes, are top notch. Loki also has a fantastic score, easy to forget, but I also think the music in Phase 4 managed to set up some memorable motifs we'll be hearing a lot of in the future, like that WandaVision doo 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 doo, or the Captain Falcon bum bottom. The Sylvie Loki romance was appropriately weird, and I like that. Also, the Mobius jet ski romance was the kind of dumb character building that the MCU does very well. And I appreciate that they actually made Loki bisexual, even though it's something they easily could have skipped. LGBTQIA representation was all over the place in this phase, but this was one of the more natural instances. And it was cute that they did it on the bisexual lighting planet and in the episode where he throws someone out a window and says, Bye. And Tom Hiddleston is such a win for the MCU in general. He has so much fun with this role. Apparently he knows more about the MCU than anyone, except for one person who we'll get to. And he's just a very good actor who brings a lot of heart to Loki. It is great that they were able to bring him back in a way that is not only not contrived, but a natural next step for this character. Whenever anybody says Phase 4 is all bad, my first thought is, where were you during the summer of 2021 when everyone saw and loved Shang-Chi? Because that movie was such a winner. Some highlights. Getting Tony Leung and Michelle Yeoh in one of these is an accomplishment in itself. And unlike other prestige actors who Marvel wasted, like Lee Pace or Mads Mikkelsen, Leung became one of the most complex villains in the MCU. On top of that, the fact that they were able to thread this retcon so perfectly is truly impressive. Fans thought we would never see a proper Mandarin on screen after Trevor, and we were very wrong. And on top of that, Shang-Chi has the most effective action we've seen yet. The bus scene has everything. Structured very well, has an impressive amount of creativity, and so many of those stunts were done somewhat practically. Again, Sarah Finn does not miss, and Simu Liu as Shang-Chi is one of those castings that's going to pay off big time over the next 10 years. He did the work and was able to pull off so many wild stunts. It is a far cry from the days of Iron Fist. And man, that opening fight between Wen Wu and Yang Li is perfect. Cannot ask for a better introduction to those characters and that movie. I'm not 100% on this because we did have some other great ones in this phase, but that might be the all around best fight scene in phase four, maybe. Also a small thing, but this soundtrack is probably my favorite Marvel has produced. Sorry, Kendrick. Not the score, but the soundtrack. Specifically songs like Run It by DJ Snake Rick Ross and Brian, Every Summertime by Nikki, and Fire in the Sky by Anderson Pock are songs I listen to so many times that I am sick of them now. The frequently forgotten middle child of Phase 4 is Marvel's What If. And listen, clearly not my favorite show. But the things it did well, it did well. The fight choreography in the Party Thor and Infinity Ultron episodes stand out as particularly over the top in a way that only animation can deliver. And some of the action sequences in general are pretty wild. That tracking shot of Captain Carter going through the planes in midair, fantastic. And the voice actors Marvel got to fill out the roles did a great job. I loved Lake Bell as replacement widow. And of course, Ross Marquardt as Infinity Ultron was great, glad he gets more room to shine. And we have a Watcher now, like a full-on Watu the Watcher who can never interfere until he always does is in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Imagine that after seeing Iron Man 2. Eventually there will be an animated what-if show starring Jeffrey Wright as the Watcher. Unreal. 
The most important thing about Eternals to me was that Chloe Zhao was able to do her thing. This did not feel like Marvel took over like so many of the fans feared. This was a Chloe Zhao, quiet, contemplative, everything at Golden Hour movie. And when you step back and look at the cast for this one, perhaps the most impressive cast in any superhero movie ever that wasn't bringing together a bunch of existing characters into one ensemble. This movie introduced Selma Hayek, Angelina Jolie, Gemma Chan, Jack Kumal Nanjiani, Barry Kogan, Bill Skarsgård, Ma Dong Suk, Richard Madden, Brian Tyree Henry, Kit Harington, Harry Styles, and Patton Oswalt. This cast is stacked with A-listers and award winners. And not to say Lauren Ridloff or Leah McHugh were not great, but those first 12 names are just so many stars. Like, the idea that Angelina Jolie is in a Marvel movie feels wild. Like, she's up there with Tom Cruise and Leonardo DiCaprio on that list of people who I never thought would do one of these. Also, I know he's probably Steven Yoon, but I think Leo would be a great sentry. It's not too late. Speaking of Lauren Ridloff, though, two things. First of all, first F superhero, cool. But second, Somehow, Marvel made the best everybody vs. Superman fight scene in live action. And hot damn, for me, Makari charging Icarus and Sonic booming him into a wall is more than worth the price of admission. They finally figured out how to make live action super speed thrilling. Also, Eternals features the only Disney's first openly gay character that actually feels like a gay character and not a background player who says they're into whatever. I'm only using the word gay because it's the phrase that went around for a while, Disney's first openly gay character. But this was a win for all LGBTQIA plus representation. Two men raising a child in a loving home kissed on screen. That's going to sound like a crazy sentence in 10 years, I hope, like the novelty has worn off. But for now, this was a genuinely new thing that Eternals did for the first time in any of these without fumbling it. Also, crazy sentence for a comic book fan to hear. In a big budget studio movie produced by one of the largest studios in the business, the Eternals formed the Unimind to give Cersei enough power to turn a celestial into a big weird island. Like it's wild that we got a movie where that happened and DC is almost ready to release their first Flash movie. No shade though, it looks fun. Hawkeye might be the single Phase 4 project that has grown on me the most since I've seen it. Because originally, I thought it was fine. It was not the most faithful adaptation of the Fraction series, but it got some of the aesthetic and the heart right. Renner is good as always, Haley was a solid addition. I had a good time with it. And I don't know what it is, but I checked back up and Hawkeye might be my third favorite Marvel show. First of all, it delivers on the Christmas thing. Thematically, it was all about family and all that, but also aesthetically, they did not have acid. We had decorations, sweaters, and stockings all over, and the whole thing ended with Clint jumping onto the 30 Rock Christmas tree. And I'll say, I think as someone who grew up around this city, it felt like New York City, not Vancouver or an Atlanta backlot, although I'm sure there was plenty of that, but moments like Hawkeye at the Broadway show or just walking down the street felt like New York. Also my favorite poster of Phase 4, and Phase 4 had some really good posters. This is one of three that exists in my apartment. The color is great, the skyline is great, and that tagline, whoever came up with the best gifts come with a bow deserves a million raises. Also, the musical number went sort of viral and we all got tired of it, but that was some of the best world building I have ever seen. The posters, the billboards we keep seeing, how half of the song is really just about how New York is gross but we love it, and the idea that nobody in the universe can keep track of everything so they just forgot Ant-Man was not there for the Battle of New York. That stuff is great. It really makes this world feel lived in. Only one doing it better right now is the boys, but that has always been something they excel at. Also, Marvel, I know you guys are doing a Rogers the Musical one-act show at Disney World. Just tell me when it is and I will go. Also, Haley Steinfeld, great. The new character who I most want to see pop up in everything. Besides nailing the look down to those little band-aids, Haley really got Kate's energy. She's competent, but also kind of a mess. Sometimes Marvel, fairly, gets criticized for having its characters never be wrong. And while she was not morally wrong, the Hawkeye show let Kate Bishop fail. And she is one of those characters in the comics who is defined by her ability to deal with failure. Also, those outfits. Dumb, but great. Love that they're finally embracing the purple for Hawkeye. It's always been understood to be his brand, but it never felt like the costume let the purple be vivid enough to be seen from a distance. 
but now you are immediately like those two are on a team because they've got a similar aesthetic and also bows and arrows. And Kingpin was in this and he was really good. I know some people didn't like the outfit but I read somewhere that it was D'Onofrio's idea because the comic that outfit comes from was his screensaver so if you get a problem you bring it up with him. There is so much good stuff to say about Hawkeye. I'm having trouble keeping this section under 10 minutes. Yelena's cameo, brilliant. I love how she and Kate are both women around the same age, so a lesser studio could have accidentally written them to be exactly the same, but they are not. Kate and Yelena's skill sets and attitudes are completely different and complement each other really well. Echo was very good. She felt like we got the perfect amount of her to justify her presence in this story and give us a good idea of what her deal is without feeling like she was just here to promote her own show. Swordsman was fun. Love his dorky dad energy and the fact that he just loves swords, like swords are his favorite thing. That's awesome for him. And we got so many trick arrows. That one shot car chase is great. Lucky the pizza dog, great. Yeah, when you compare it to the Fraction comics, it's not as good, but that's one of the best Marvel comic runs of the 21st century. Of course, this show is not going to hit that high, but on its own merits, Hawkeye really works, and I really think it'll benefit from the annual Christmas rewatch three or four years down the line. Also, Jeremy Renner, what happened to you is awful. And I'm not fully ready to apologize for saying you headline Jeremy Renner and the Midlife Crisis Band. I mean, look at this video. It is both sexy girls who want to kiss you and just footage of your daughters. What are we supposed to take from that besides dad desperately clinging to youth? But anyway, I will admit I listen to Main Attraction all the time and I think it's actually a pretty great song. Also, I don't think we should push Jeremy back into the movies before he's ready, if he ever is, no pressure. But also, a cameo would be pretty doable since the only Hawkeye thing we have never done is give him the big flying motorcycle from the comics. So, you know, have him fly by on that and we can all cheer, I don't know. Listen, sometimes movies are chocked full of fan service to the point where the actors deliberately pause in parts where the audience is expected to clap. But if like in Spider-Man No Way Home, the movie is also great, there's not much to complain about. Plus, if it were all the Daredevil actors or something meeting, I would get it, but this is Spider-Man. In the comics, he might as well go to the multiverse once a year to get his Spider-Man license renewed. So it's not out of character. But forget about all that. This movie actually delivered on the post credit scene thing. This was not like Far From Home, where Aunt May finds out Peter is Spider-Man and then immediately is cool with it and Peter goes on a big trip. This mattered. Actions had consequences. And sure, that's pretty basic, but like I said, that is not a guarantee. And how insane is it that they got everyone back for this movie? Like, not even Reese Ifens needed to be replaced by Yoan Gruffitt or Luke Evans or another Welsh actor doing whatever accent the lizard has, I don't know, vaguely British. But they got everybody back. And not only that, everybody f***ing brought it. Nobody, except maybe Sandman, was phoning it in. Willem Dafoe went full goblin. Jamie Foxx was clearly having a ball as an Electro that was not also Batman Forever Riddler. Alfred Molina had plenty of nuance as Otto. And the other Spider-Men were perfect. Like exactly what you want. Their characters have grown, but the core of each performance is still there. Garfield finally got to prove that he's probably the best one. Toby got to talk about his fluids. And the interactions with their villains were great. Molina and Toby, Fox and Garfield. It's a shame that we didn't get any Toby Defoe, but it does seem like something may have been cut. But all those interactions between legacy characters are meaningful character moments and rock solid fan service, and I just cannot complain about that as long as the character stuff is there. Also, Daredevil was in this movie, and he was really good, perfect little cameo. And I loved how they took this opportunity to reimagine some of the costumes. As much as I like the Power Ranger armor, I think Willem Dafoe's goblin tattered hoodie was genius. And the new Electro costume with the lightning making his silly mask was great. In fact, Phase 4 was also the phase where the MCU lent into the crazy design stuff. Like in this movie, we saw the spider sense lines when Peter was in his astral form. You get more of that in Multiverse of Madness and Wakanda Forever, but this gives me hope that every mutant is not just going to look like they're a windy mime. But the craziest part about this movie is even though we had all that stuff I described going on in the background, it was still Tom Holland's movie. They did not sacrifice Peter's character for cameos, in fact it used them really effectively to develop his character. And they did that thing I always complain about, where the hero actually questioned the status quo and decided to help the villains. That is awesome. 
The acting was great, Tom hit all the right emotional beats, he's incredibly funny, and of course he can cry, but this wasn't just that, cause Tom dug up a performance that was angry, felt personal, and it led to a lot of tearful goodbyes, but also my other nominee for best phase 4 fight scene, the apartment fight. I remember me and the person I was watching it with both going, whoa, when Peter does that double wall jump and lands on Goblin, and then Willem's face as he's getting punched is perfect. And so much of that was practical with both actors on set putting in the work. You can tell. Which is particularly impressive because I think this was the last big COVID production. Not just affected by COVID, but clearly a lot of the principal photography was done during COVID. And I definitely don't want studios to rush or take risks that endanger the health of their crew, but from everything I can gather, these sets were safe, and outside of a lack of extras every so often, I really don't think you can tell. Making a movie like this is obviously very difficult, but doing it during COVID feels like a Herculean undertaking, and not only did it work, this was easily one of the most fun movies of the entire year. Moon Knight was always going to be a difficult plane to land, but let's start with the easy one. Oscar Isaac is Moon Knight, and he seems to really like it. Even though the future of the show is unclear, based on behind the scenes videos, it really does seem like this is not one of those serious actors suffering through a silly thing situations. And Oscar Isaac is a really fun version of this character. It took a while for me to get used to it, and clearly they took a lot of liberties from the comic character, but the silly accent history nerd persona and the typical Oscar Isaac action hero persona played off each other really well. And this is another costume that was terrific. The standard Moon Knight costume could have gone in a bunch of different ways, but the magical mummy version of the suit is gorgeous. He'll fit right in on the Midnight Suns with Werewolf by Night and Elsa Bloodstone and Blade. Moon Knight also gave us F. Murray Abraham's Khonshu, which first of all, looked fantastic. Like, absolutely picture perfect. And second, F. Murray Abraham played a bird god skeleton in the MCU. That's wild. Also, Lila, the Scarlet Scarab was cool. One of the first, if not the first superhero made exclusively for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the action in Moon Knight was solid when we could see it. The fight against the horse guys and the one in the finale had some good choreography. And I can't speak to the dissociative identity disorder portrayal, but I did not see too much criticism of it at the time, so that's a good sign. And I thought the music was fun. Overall, I appreciate how weird Moon Knight was. While it may not have always landed them, it took bold swings and I respect that. I think Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness might be my favorite MCU movie of 2022 for one reason, Mr. Fantastic Explodes. No, I love Multiverse of Madness because it looks like a movie. Another director with a very specific style was given enough control to turn this project into something that felt uniquely theirs. The camera angles, the zooms, the screaming women, this was Raimi through and through. And thematically, I think the story was pretty strong. A look at how different choices affect us and whether we can change our fate by having a character visit different versions of himself in worlds where he made the wrong choice. Can he ever be happy? Is he destined to fail? It was a consistent story. And man, those action sequences were terrific. Fighting Gargantos, the Illuminati, Wanda destroying Kamartage. This movie went so hard when it came to not only what these guys could do, but how. Sure, Doctor Strange has done weird magic before, but he's never just made a pair of extra big hands out of nowhere or turned musical notes into shuriken. This was that thing I've always been waiting for, where Doctor Strange has so many spells he never needs to repeat one because he can pull all kinds of random stuff out of thin air. He's not just making different spinny glowing discs. And Wanda doing all her weird monster movie chaos magic, everything felt intentional, it looked deliberate. And man, I know some people aren't huge fans of the cameos, but the Illuminati scene was a treat. Perhaps the most brutal action we have seen in the MCU. A dude's head exploded. And yes, I know there were some criticisms that there was not that much multiverse hopping in this multiverse movie, but I do think that is a title expectations kind of thing. And also there was that one shot in the trailer of them going through the multiverses that was in every single trailer. That if you take that out and just look at this movie as a story it is trying to tell, I think it's doing a really good job. Like if they had called it Doctor Strange versus the Scarlet Witch, this would have delivered 100%. And I know not everyone loves what they did with Wanda's character, but either way, again, Elizabeth Olsen brought it. Full camp. The evil witch and the deadite Wanda were both bizarre. Also, I know I keep saying it, but how about those costumes? The Scarlet Witch costume is pretty much exactly what you want from that costume. Everything you liked about it from WandaVision got improved a little bit. It looks a little darker. And this strange costume looks great. 
I've always liked it, but some of the very small design flourishes help make it feel like less of a traditional robe and more of a living magical artifact. Then you've got Black Bolt's costume, which was quite an improvement over the live action version that doesn't exist, and Professor X got his chair. And back to the Spider-Man headlines, we finally get to see Professor X use telepathy with concentric circles radiating from his head. This is what I'm talking about when it comes to visualizing mutant powers. They need to look like something, and this is exactly how you do it. And how about all these extras? The sets feel like real places filled with civilians, which makes strange protecting people feel even more heroic. And it's a nice departure from the COVID-y sets of Spider-Man No Way Home. And hey, everyone who complained about the Marvel color grading on Twitter, they fixed it. This movie looks fantastic. Colors pop, blacks are black, and sure, there's a lot of CGI, but most of it doesn't come with that flat lighting that so many of these studios use these days. Listen, I get why people don't like this one, but I just cannot help but have a good time with it. Rachel McAdams says go back to hell and shoots two demons with that face from the first movie, which is apparently a flamethrower. Cinema. Right off the bat, as someone from Jersey, I loved the Jersey City-ness of Miss Marvel. The side characters, the street fairs, this show, and most of Phase 4 had a very specific local identity. Shang-Chi is in San Francisco, Hawkeye is visiting New York City, Moon Knight lives in London, kind of. I like that these are not all taking place in New York. And even the ones in the same area don't take place in the same city. Like WandaVision and Miss Marvel both take place in New Jersey and feel completely different. But Miss Marvel, I mean, first big Muslim superhero and definitely not in the usual first blank character way. Kamala went to a mosque, a wedding, she even visited Pakistan for an episode. This show had a new identity. And the big highlight of the series was Iman Vellani. I know Iman watches videos about the MCU and goes on the subreddit, so if you're watching, let me say, Iman, you're crushing it. That's all I have to say. I don't have advice on how to be a superhero, but whatever you're doing, keep doing that. I like that this character has tons of personality, and thankfully, it's not someone who's jaded. Kamala just genuinely loves superheroes and all of this stuff that we also love, so it's really easy for us to relate to Kamala. And a great costume. I know Kamala's getting a new one in The Marvels, but I hope this one comes back next season because it's cool. Originally, I was a little confused with how her mom got the most intricate MCUE costume in like a day, but I've been assured by multiple people that know Pakistani seamstresses are just that good. I also love that this show incorporated social media in a way that felt realistic. These stories do not exist in a bubble. People would see them and react to them. It helps sell them to us as a spectacle and get us excited. And while I've said I'm not the biggest fan of the hard light instead of regular polymorphing, I do think that effect looked great. The purple was a nice compliment to Kamala's costume color scheme. It also did feel real. I liked how Kamala actually embiggened in episode 6. I hope that's what we go with all the time from now on. I believe this is currently the highest rated Marvel show in Rotten Tomatoes, and even if it's not everybody's favorite, like mine I think is still probably WandaVision, this did an excellent job of introducing a character that's going to be a big player in things going forward and making her very likable and interesting. Listen, I understand people who did not love the humor of Thor Love and Thunder. However, there were a bunch of jokes that did work for me, and I'm more surprised than anyone that some of those jokes were goat related. The goats shutting up after someone says they should eat the goats. The thud of everybody landing in the shadow realm and then a second and then the goats screaming. Thought that was very funny, well-timed joke. Also love the we don't eat children anymore dark times line. Chris Hemsworth is just too funny. It's unfair that he is both so handsome and also so funny. And I really, really appreciate the swings they took with the Jane Cancer story. It was appropriately serious when it needed to be. The fight scenes in this movie were also all pretty great. The intro on the Owl Planet was particularly fun. The puppets, or whatever they were, were appropriately weird. The fight with Zeus and his henchmen was cool. Lots of creative shots, characters working together. And then the fight in the Shadow Realm was excellent my third contender for possible best action sequence in Phase 4. I love how the lack of color helps to focus on the important characters so nobody gets lost in the scene, and all the characters are pulling off very creative maneuvers. It's a real treat to watch. Also, speaking of Zeus, loved Russell Crowe as Zeus. I think taking a prestige actor and just throwing him into a goofy costume, asking them to ham it up for a few minutes in one of these is a great idea. And while he's not quite the revelation that Jeff Goldblum was, Crowe's Zeus and his skirt and his silly accent all really worked for me. 
and the design of the gods in general. They could have all just been guys in robes, but the omnipotent city was full of all kinds of weird alienish super beings. Speaking of design, again, Thor's first two costumes were terrific. His guardian sleeveless jacket was exactly what that character would wear and fit right in in the 80s hair metal soundtrack that Taika Thor movies are known for. And then the second costume, leather with the fur cape, brilliant. I don't know why this was not the costume throughout the movie. It looks great, feels real, and harkens back to the look of young Thor in the Jason Aaron run. And the themes of this movie also really showed through. What does vulnerability look like to a god? How does hatred corrupt an otherwise righteous warrior? I don't know. There's just a lot that I liked there. Now, you guys know I might be She-Hulk's number one fan, and I really did love nearly everything about it. Casting, Tatiana Maslany worked as Jen and She-Hulk, all of her supporting law firm cast was fun, this version of Titania felt like the logical reimagining of the character in the age of the influencer, all the cameos, Banner, Wong, Blonsky, and Daredevil felt perfectly balanced so that they all made a mark but did not steal focus. Some of the effects were terrific, usually the ones that counted, like the fight scenes, the big moments, all that looked amazing. And it was funny. A light elf impersonating everyone and trying to get out of trouble with the Asgard is not a place, it's a people speech. The magicians doing magic in court. The wedding. I mean, this show introduced Patty Harrison into the MCU. Awesome. I think I knew I would love She-Hulk after that first post credit scene. Had me laughing out loud at 3am. You know what else? I liked that She-Hulk was adult. Not like cursing or anything, but just felt like 30 year olds talking, going to bars, going on bad dates, having awkward one night stands and less awkward ones. We criticize the MCU frequently for not being sexy anymore. It seems like that has been suppressed to appeal to the all ages crowd, and I get that, but this felt like one for the slightly older people. And listen, maybe the finale is not for you. I get it, but I loved it. It felt super true to the comics and also just felt like something new. Jen's right. Even if a big fight is what we expected, we wouldn't have wanted that either. And the design of Kevin? Very fun. I love the hat and I'm glad that the director fought for it. She-Hulk gave us so many things things. Mutants, Vampires, Madison, The Wrecking Crew, Leapfrog, Mr. Immortal. We have a Great Lakes Avengers reference. It's only a matter of time until Flatman's powers get changed because they look too similar to Mr. Fantastic. I really, really, really just love this show and hope it gets a second season or She-Hulk shows up in something else soon. Hey everybody, remember Werewolf by Night? Yeah, that was great in Phase 4. The first Marvel special presentation was pretty much everything you could ask for. Short, fun, bloody, kinda silly, introduced some new characters and concepts, and most importantly, it felt like something we had not seen before. It was a complete genre piece, felt right out of a Universal Monster Movie marathon. The colors, the lighting, the music, and obviously, the overacting. I know everybody in it was pretty good, but Harriet Sansom Harris took this thing from a 7 to a 9. She nailed the over-the-top energy you need to make one of these work, and that energy was able to let performers like Gal Garcia Bernal and Laura Donnelly play it a little more reserved, and the entire thing did not feel like a drag. On top of that, the practical effects were fantastic. All the blood, the flaming tubas, the silly maze, the zombie guy, they were all real and tangible. And as crazy as it is that Werewolf by Night is in the MCU now, we also have Man-Thing, Ted Salas, and someone burned at the touch of the Man-Thing. I love the dynamic between Russell and Man-Thing, as well as the back and forth between Russell and Bloodstone. I hope all three return for a Midnight Suns something. Maybe Moon Knight Season 2 is the Midnight Suns season. Have those four, Blade and the Black Knight, go kill Dracula or whatever. Overall, this made me so excited for the future of these special presentations, and I have to give it up to one of my favorite composers, Speed Racer's Michael Giacchino, who directed Werewolf by Night. The fact that it was the first time he has directed anything is wild, considering not only how well it fits into this subgenre, but also how much it just looked great in general. One of the best shot things in Phase 4. I've heard rumors that we may have another one of these coming every year, like every Halloween there's some sort of horror-themed special presentation, and I hope that's the case because this one was excellent. And then we have Black Panther Wakanda Forever, the Oscar-nominated Black Panther Wakanda Forever, although Suicide Squad won an Oscar, so what is that distinction even worth? Wakanda Forever was in an impossibly difficult spot. The sequel to one of the most acclaimed and beloved MCU movies that also planned to introduce a reimagined version of Marvel's Fish People, and then also needed to deal with the fact that the face of the franchise and all-around great guy Chadwick Boseman died right before they were going to film. Apparently, the last conversation Coogler had with Boseman was about the new draft of the script for Wakanda Forever. So this really did take everybody by surprise. 
The fact that Wakanda Forever is even coherent as a film is a miracle, but it manages to also tell a complex story about loss and grief with some of the best performances in the MCU. You guys know I'm not Letitia Wright's biggest fan, but she committed to this role in a way that is admirable, and everybody in the supporting cast managed to turn in some of the MCU's best performances so far. I also think the fact that Namor worked is a second miracle, and not only was he dangerous and complex, he was appropriately silly. They gave him those little wings on his feet, and he used them to absolutely absolutely decimate the Wakandan Air Force. That scene is like something out of a Marvel fever dream. Namor flying around and ripping ships out of the air. I think the pivot from regular Atlanteans to the Talokanil was genius. Not only did it set them in a very specific place and time, but it gave the fish people an aesthetic that set them apart from the Atlanteans of the DC Universe without feeling like a superficial change. Also loved the way Namora and Atuma looked. The jawbone helmet on Atuma and the fish feather things on Namora's headdress were very cool. I also really appreciate Val's part in the story. Sure, maybe there was a little bit too much of her, but I love how the story about two isolated civilizations dealing with the effects of colonialism had a character who's in charge of the CIA basically say, oh yeah, we'd love to destroy that country and steal their resources. It's a bold move. I certainly hope we see more of Namor in the future because I really dug Tenoch Huerta's version of the character. Mostly, I like that this Namor is both flirty and a jerk. The single adjective I most associate with Namor from the comics is moody, and I think they nailed that. And before the phase was over, we got a Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. And that was a real treat. Silly, sweet, had a goofy song. They got the real life Kevin Bacon. Mantis solidified her role as the most watchable Guardian. I don't think we're going to get one of these every year, but this proves that the special presentations are the perfect delivery method for weird ideas that are fun, but not important enough to be a movie and not long enough to be a show. In conclusion, phase four was a messy step, but probably the right one. We got so many new characters people love, like Shang-Chi, Kamala Khan, She-Hulk, Kate Bishop, Yelena, Agatha, Walker, Makari, and the rest of the Eternals, Sylvie, Mobius, Red Guardian, The Watcher, Moon Knight, Werewolf by Night, Elsa Bloodstone, Man-Thing, Namor, Madison, and Cosmo. Phase 4 introduced the multiverse without it being too confusing. I think most people that watched either Loki or Doctor Strange more or less get it. If anything, I think stuff like Doctor Strange did not have enough multiverse. It focused on projects that were the product of directors and creatives with their own vision, Raimi, Zhao, Watiti, Kugler, and it brought some new writers to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like WandaVision's Jack Schaefer is working on Coven of Chaos and Vision Quest. Michael Waldron wrote Multiverse of Madness and Loki, and now he's working on Secret Wars. And while some of the projects weren't perfect, a lot of them started really strong. In fact, almost all of the shows had like five out of six really, really good entertaining episodes. And like James Gunn is doing with DC, Phase 4 was so clearly inspired by the great Marvel comics of the last couple of decades. Fractions Hawkeye, the King Vision series, Morales' Truth Red, White, and Black, Lemire's Moon Knight, Wilson's Miss Marvel, Slot's She-Hulk, and even going further back, Jack Kirby's Eternals. We pretty much just had an Esed Ribich panel translated directly onto the screen in Love and Thunder. So maybe it's not all perfect, but it seems like they're on the right track, and Marvel gets it. They're slowing down production, spacing out the projects, giving these things more time to cook, and hopefully we'll start seeing the results pretty soon. Is that what you want me to say? Speaking of saving the world, I'll be honest with you guys. I did not get carbon offsets. I knew they were sort of planting trees and businesses use them in a way that seems like a scam. I learned this from a Wendover video that got quoted on John Oliver, so I'd written them off. Until Ren came along. These guys are legit. So legit that Wendover gave them their stamp of approval. Usually these programs don't make a difference, but Ren does. So I said, it's good enough for me. Let's check them out. And they're pretty cool. Ren invests money into projects that make a real difference and offset the carbon you put into the atmosphere when you travel and stuff like that. And yeah, they do the tree planting stuff, but they also do things I did not even know needed to be done. Like they have an entire project to destroy all the old refrigerants that we got rid of in the 80s but are still just sitting around in tanks that wear down and leak into the atmosphere. So they're doing smart stuff like that. They've got projects around clean cooking fuel, preventing forest fires. Go check it out. Just click the button on the screen or follow the link in the description and read more about their offsets, and even better, the first month of emissions are free for the first 100 people who sign up. Thank you to everybody that continues to support the channel on Patreon, everybody that watches my videos early on Nebula, everybody that listens to my podcast, mostly nitpicking, everybody who follows me on Twitch and Twitter and all that stuff on Nando V Movies on all those platforms. That's all I got. Stay safe. I'll see you next time.